so yeah, I started here in August of this year. Uh, I originally I came from Three River Falls. I grew up there on a small family farm. You know, grew up fixing things my whole life. Ended up getting interested in medicine after having both good and bad experiences with uh, you know physicians and surgeons in, in particular, and thought that that you know difference of kind of staying current and really knowing what you're doing and doing it at a level of excellence made a big difference in my life. Uh, prompted me to go to medical school. I did that in Duluth after finishing a biology degree in Morris. Uh, then visited North Dakota, where I did my general surgery training and met my wife. Uh, and then we, we settled here in May, and I started working in August. Uh, so I'm happy to call Grand Rapids my home. I live up on a Bovee address on Trout Lake, and it's a, a beautiful place to live and play. So uh, I'm happy to be here, and, and hopefully I can make it my home for quite a while. Uh, I wanted to do this talk on, on GERD, which is an acronym. There's lots of acronyms in medicine. And this one's gastroesophageal reflux disease because it's such a common problem and it affects so many people. And I think as you age and other things happen in your life, it becomes more common. And at some point, it, it can really uh, sort of decrease your quality of life to a point where it's uh, pretty miserable. So we'll get right into it. And in general, uh, our, our health habits and our eating habits have made uh, this gastroesophageal reflux disease common. Anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of Americans deal with it uh, and have symptomatic GERD. Uh, and of those people, you know, about 7 to 10 percent of people deal with it every single day. And these m numbers may not capture everybody because there's a lot of people that you know, only have occasional symptoms and they grab something over the counter and it goes away and that's, that's as far as it goes. So, it, you know, I would say 25 to 40 percent of people is probably a pretty conservative estimate. So my objectives for the talk, uh, I wanted to go through the definition of what is GERD, uh, the epidemiology or basically uh, who it happens to and why it happens, uh, how it shows itself, what we do to look into it, what we can do to treat it, and what are the bad things that come uh, as a complication to having GERD uh, that goes unchecked. So the American College of Gastroenterology describes it as symptoms uh, or mucosal damage uh, produced by the abnormal reflux. So really, there's that, that kind of emphasizes that there's two categories. Uh, the people that have symptoms, you know, they have heartburn, they have pain, they have acid in the back of their throat, or they have, you know, food coming into the back of their mouth, or they might be completely silent and not have symptoms and have the damage that's going on in the background. And often there's a disconnect between those people where a lot of the people that have symptoms don't have a lot of damage, and a lot of people that have a lot of symptoms look just fine on the inside. Unfortunately, it's chronic and relapsing, so you can heal some damage from it or get over your symptoms, and then something makes it come on again, and you get symptoms back again. Uh, and some people end up being sort of dependent on medications uh, for a long time because of that. And then one of the things that I worry about is that you know, we may be missing complications that come from it uh, when the people aren't having a lot of symptoms because they're not getting checked and it's going on in the background. You know, everybody has a little bit of GERD. You know, everybody eats something a little too late, lays down, you know, stuff goes in the back of their mouth at some point. I think every woman that's been pregnant had GERD at some point during their pregnancy. It's just inevitable. Uh, so what's normal GERD? And so normal GERD comes after eating. It's uh, short-lived. You don't have a lot of symptoms from it, and it only happens during the daytime, you know, for the most part. Pathologic GERD or, or you know, GERD that we're worried about is ones that have symptoms, ones that are creating damage on the inside, or people that are having symptoms when they go to bed at night and, and they're continued throughout the night. So that's sort of a way to kind of figure out if you're normal, you know, run on the mill and yeah, every once in a while I get some symptoms, or maybe have something a little bit more bothersome going on. One of the things that uh, contributes a big mechanism to controlling your stomach acid and keeping it in your stomach is something called your lower esophageal sphincter. 
Uh, and the sphincter is just a circular ring of muscles. Uh, this one happens to be at the bottom of your esophagus. And its job is to work with your diaphragm uh, to contract after food goes in and between each breath so you're not get having stuff you know, yo-yo up and down in your esophagus all day. And it's, it's not you know, a really robust, robust muscle. And there's some things that can make it not work as well that we'll talk about. Um, so again, in terms of why GERD happens, uh, the, the lower esophageal sphincter is the primary barrier. Uh, hiatal hernia, uh, you probably, a lot of people have heard of this. A uh, hiatal hernia is when that part of your esophagus that should be right at your diaphragm, kind of the border between your abdomen and your chest, starts to slide up. Uh, and so then you can imagine if this area that's supposed to be doing all the work holding the you know, stomach acid and food in your stomach is slid up in your chest where there's a lot less pressure, then things want to go up even more easily. So it's sort of a slippery slope, uh, no pun intended, once, uh, once you have a hiatal hernia to have reflux happen much more often. Another thing that can con contribute to it is uh, if you're not making as much saliva, you know, you have dry mouth or you're people are aging and they're not making as much saliva. The saliva does a good job of washing acid continually from your uh, mouth down your esophagus and getting that acid back into your stomach where you know, your body's properly equipped to handle it. And then as, as you see uh, GERD happen, uh, some of the protective mechanisms that we have uh, in our esophagus uh, get worn out. And so uh, those primary mechanisms are mucus and bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is just a base that neutralizes the acid. Mucus, we all know what that is. That's just slime that gives a protective barrier. This kind of shows a, a bunch of stuff, and it's a little busy. Uh, but some of the things that we talk, we're talking about Contributing to GERD include the hiatal hernia. Um, some people don't clear secretions from their esophagus as well if they may have a swallowing disorder or something wrong with their muscles of the esophagus. Then stuff that refluxes up into their esophagus doesn't get pushed back down where it's supposed to. And believe it or not, even when we're not thinking about swallowing, our esophagus is making little contractions that keep things pushed down the whole time. So it's sort of like a conveyor belt of every once in a while squeezing food or spit into our stomach, even when you're not actively doing it under your own control. Um, we talked about the saliva issue. Um, <coughs> we talked about things that can break down those barriers. Uh, and then there's certain things that can result in reduced pressure at that lower esophageal sphincter. Um, one thing that kind of makes sense is if your stomach gets really full from a big meal or some people have other conditions that makes their stomach not empty properly, reflux becomes much worse. It's sort of your stomach gets distended, your abdomen gets distended, there's a lot of pressure there driving stuff back up into your esophagus and into your chest. And both the pylor pylorus, which is the exit to your stomach, and if your stomach is, is delayed and empty and contribute to that. And then some people make too much acid uh, or, or uh, a different chemical in your stomach, which is pepsin, and that can contribute to a sort of a hyperacidic state. And that's a little bit less common, certainly, more, uh, certainly less common than GERD in general, but uh, does happen as well. So how, how does your lower esophageal lose its tone? You know, is it lazy to quit working out? We're at the YMCA tonight. So uh, <laughs> I thought maybe that would be a good way to address it. But really, it's a muscle that you don't have any control over. It's a, it's a smooth muscle. And unfortunately, a lot of medications that we use to control uh, blood pressure and depression and really common things that we need also cause that smooth muscle to relax. Uh, and and uh, some of them also uh, can make you be a little bit, uh, have less uh, secretions like anticholinergic agents. And that looks like a big word, but something as simple as Benadryl is an anticholinergic agent. So it's, you know, that gives you a dry mouth and then you have less secretions uh, and antihistamines. So really common medications that we use can make GERD a little bit worse. There's food that makes your lower esophageal sphincter a little bit more relaxed. And unfortunately, they're really good and tasty foods. Uh, chocolate, fatty foods, onions, peppermint, and garlic. 
And so we'll talk about lifestyle decisions and lifestyle modification in a little bit, but it's really tough because a lot of the times the things that give people the worst symptoms are things that they really like, and it's, it's, it's a tough sell or, or a real trade-off whether they're willing to give them up. And smoking or the nicotine in it also reduces your low esophageal sphincter tone. So this is sort of the diagram that I have for hiatal hernia. You can see in the normal setting, this is the division between your chest and your abdomen. Your chest has kind of a vacuum, essentially. It goes in, in a negative pressure whenever you're breathing and moving air in, and then a little bit of a positive pressure whenever you're breathing and moving air out. So if you can imagine if your uh, hiatus in your lower esophageal sphincter slides up, every time you're breathing, essentially there's a seesaw motion of acid that goes up higher and higher in your esophagus. Um, and this is just sort of a weakness and a sliding of that normal position of the, of the hiatus and, and of your lower esophageal sphincter that can come from you know, a variety of reasons. <coughs> so into the bad stuff that comes from GERD when it's not so innocent. Uh, erosive esophagitis is inflammation of your esophagus. That's all that means. Uh, and it can be pretty dramatic uh, to the point where it's bleeding and there's really deep uh, cracks and, and damage into your esophagus that goes all the way in the muscle. And I, I am retouching on this that oftentimes the symptoms don't match the severe severity. So you'll see someone that, you know, I've been on a PPI for 10 years. My doc wanted me to get a EGD, which is a scope down the throat. And, and I'm not really having any symptoms, but I just like to be sure. And, and you look in there, and it's just raw. It looks like hamburger. It's all tore up. And they weren't having symptoms at all. And, and so off, you know, there, it's pretty, pretty commonly where I see, see people that you know, their, their symptoms don't match what it looks like on the inside from one extreme to the other. As that heals, it can result in a stricture. That's just a scar in your, in your esophagus that's tighter than the rest. And that usually manifests in patients with a difficult time swallowing or having food stick, especially solid foods and bread stick in the bottom of their esophagus. Uh, Barrett's esophagus, you know, it's a funny person's name attached to something, but it's just uh, the changing of one cell type to another. And, well, that's not so bad, but it's sort of a precursor to a couple things. One of the stricture, which we just touched on, if you develop Barrett's, you have a, you know, one, three chance about of getting a stricture. The other thing is that we worry because that has a much higher incidence of turning into esophageal cancer. So once we are screening somebody or they're having some reason that I'm looking in their esophagus and I see Barrett's, then they get screened on a regular basis because we don't want to miss dysplasia that can progress to cancer. Otherwise, esophageal cancer is pretty hard to detect, so we have to kind of look in there and be diligent if we see these precancerous changes. So. What are typical symptoms? This is kind of what everyone thinks about when they uh, think about heartburn as a term in general. And we know that this may be brought on by things that make more pressure in our abdomen or make gravity not work for us. And so, uh, you know, laying down in a recumbent position, you may, bending over, or eating a meal that's high in fat, those all are things that will pretty notoriously bring on heartburn. Uh, but it also incru includes regurgitation, so not just the acid, but also getting food or something that you've eaten or spit back up into your mouth. One of our body's mechanisms to responding to GERD and trying to protect us is hypersalivation, or making a lot of spit. Uh, so you might notice that you get the bad taste in your mouth, you're having a little acid reflux, and then you're making a lot of spit, and you're swallowing, and you're swallowing, and you're swallowing, and everything seems to be running. That's oh, your, our body's own way of protecting. Um, belching also comes with it. You know, if you're regurgitating acid or, or food, you know, air comes up too, and, and that can be a symptom of your reflux. You know, so these are all the symptoms that we see pretty often. People might use something on occasion for them. And in general, they don't really warrant too much of a workup, and, and they shouldn't cause much alarm. Atypical symptoms. These are the things that I don't think, uh, if you didn't know about it, you would ever associate with acid reflux. They're things that don't you know, seem to be on paper tied to it at all, but they do make sense. Uh, and so these are things like, asthma that, you, that doesn't get triggered by normal stuff. People that only cough at night or only have asthma at night when they're laying flat on their back, 
a lot of those people have acid reflux and the acid is going up into their mouth and then they're inhaling it in their lungs and it causes things to just squeeze and tighten down. Uh, and so if you're having a lot of that acid come up into the back of your throat, you may be hoarse. Uh, you may have an irritated throat or pharyngitis. Uh, you might have chest pain, like substernal chest pain that just doesn't make any sense. I see a lot of people that get EKGs. They get worked up by their primary doc. They visit the ER. Everything checks out. But I, you know, they still have this chest pain. And so we end up scoping them. And some of them we find esophagitis in. Or some of them may not have any findings at all on the inside, but still might have GERD that's causing it. And so it's a, a pretty vexing problem when you can't get to the bottom of this chest pain that makes everybody really nervous when it happens because it's, you know, it gives you the sensation like you're feeling like you're going to die and everything goes through fine and, and, you know, but you still have this sensation coming over and over and over again. And then uh, lastly, dental erosion. Sometimes your dentist is going to be the one that tells you, oh, maybe, maybe there's acid washing up into here because all your enamel is worn away or appears to be getting eaten away by acid, which does happen. And the last category is alarm symptoms. Uh, and things that are really worrisome uh, to me as a surgeon and, and should be worrisome to your healthcare providers too if you're describing them. And those are difficulty swallowing, uh, early satiety or feeling full or not hungry earlier than you used to be. GI bleeding, I told you that uh, your esophagus can kind of look like hamburger on the inside if you're having a lot of erosions develop from this uh, acid reflux disease. Uh, some people get a fear of swallowing or get pain every time they swallow because it's so irritated or so raw. Vomiting or have, you know, unexplained vomiting that's not occurring when they're sick or something else is provoking it. Weight loss, iron deficiency, anemia, I mean low iron counts and low blood counts. Uh, choking that comes with eating or after eating, uh, or just continued pain like I talked about before. All of these sort of categories are things that should raise a little either yellow or red flag in, in our brains <coughs> when we think about them. So the question is, the, is the continued pain localized or spread around? And it's, it's really poorly defined. It's not, uh, you know, the problem with pain on the inside or from your organs is it usually doesn't have a single spot that it manifests because we don't have uh, the same sort of sensation that, that innervates our gut and our inside of our chest. So it can be, you know, like neck pain, you know, pain up in your chest all the way through to the middle of your abdomen. And it, and it doesn't make sense with where the damage is or the severity of it, but you can have pain sort of between here and here, and it might be from your, your acid reflux disease. So it's really frustrating as a surgeon, as a person that does endoscopy, to figure out which symptoms are going with what and what we can do to fix it. And so uh, get into what to do about it. And uh, I would prefer to not ever start anybody on medications or do surgery on them if we can. Uh, lifestyle modification is the first category. That includes avoiding the triggers, uh, not eating close to bedtime, raising the head of the bed. We'll talk about it a little bit more. If that doesn't work, and unfortunately I'd love to push that on everybody, but they're, they're hard things to give up. They're things that you don't have control over all the time, and it only works in 10 to 20 percent of people. So. It's, you know, a, you know, good things to do, and if that gets you to the point where you're not having problems with your reflux anymore, great. You know, you don't have to see me again the rest of your life. We can go on a part ways and have have a have a good have a good time. But uh, if if that doesn't get you all the way, uh, then the next thing that we usually try is medications. And I sort of have an escalating order where I'll try something like Zantac or an H2 blocker. That's just a histamine blocker. And if that doesn't work, we go to a proton pump inhibitor, which is a PPI, which is more acronyms to throw at you. But that one blocks the final little mechanism that makes acid. Right at the bottom of the cell where the, where the acid is being produced, that w those medications block that. So essentially, when you're on a proton pump inhibitor, if you're on enough of it, you don't make any acid at all. The question is, is there any detrimental uh, effects of being on a PPI indefinitely? And, and that is catching a lot of mainstream media attention recently, because when these first came out, we thought they were perfect. You know, they block all the acid. You can make no acid whatsoever if you're on enough of these things. Uh, they seem to be well tolerated, you know, maybe a few side effects. 
And as we're looking at them now that millions and millions of people are on them worldwide, we're seeing some trends uh, come up with them. And the ones that have came out so far are low magnesium, low magnesium levels. Uh, they're associated with chronic kidney disease or you know, uh, your kidney's not working as well, progressing towards renal failure over time. Uh, and, and there's some more uh, things that are coming out, but they don't apply to the US population as much. They're, they're coming from Japan where stomach cancer is much more common. Uh, so they're not completely innocent, and we're trying to get people off of them as a you know shift in healthcare. So the question is, how does the use of those drugs affect digestion? And uh, most people digest things just fine without the acid there. Some people notice some change in their bowel habits, maybe a little lo looser stools, maybe a little nausea. Uh, they're usually pretty poorly defined, and even without the acid there, usually you're able to digest food just fine. That, for whatever reason, it still works. Um, <clears throat> your stomach isn't a sterile environment once it becomes uh, no longer acidic, so that you can have other bacteria grow in there, and that causes sort of some other problems if you happen to aspirate what comes comes out of your stomach when it's growing bacteria in there, as you can imagine. But for the most part, digestion still works. There's a few enzymes that require at least some acid present to work. Uh, but for the most part, people still digest th things just fine with a PPI on board. If medications don't work, a lot of times that's the point where you'll get involved with uh, somebody like me or a gastroenterologist, and we'll do an EGD, which is an upper scope, or in some, some occasions, do a little microchip or a little catheter down your nose that is a pH probe monitor and look at you for 24 hours seeing how often acid is coming up out of your stomach uh, and into your esophagus. And then the goals of treatment are controlling your symptoms. Uh, one, I don't want you to be miserable. I want you to be able to do what you want to do with your life and also uh, prevent some of the complications uh, that we see and allow for healing to occur. So, you know, this is the point where your doctor tells you you got to quit smoking and cut out caffeine and garlic and onions and peppermint and everything else that tastes good to you or me. And to some extent, that, that, that definitely makes things worse. And so large meals, uh, you know, if you're eating three full-size meals a day or especially if you're having uh, one larger meal right before bedtime, that's a real recipe to have symptoms. Certain people will have trigger foods, and I like to be evidence-based, and spicy foods, although they may not disagree with some of you, don't seem to have any actual uh, acidity associated with them. So they may, may not agree with your stomach. It doesn't usually make your stomach make more acid per se. So you, you guys can argue with me all you want if, if, if they don't agree with you, but I'm telling you that it's for a different reason. It's either you don't have a taste for them or they just make you feel different, but usually there's no acid or reflux that occurs more with those. Um, fat tends to separate out in your stomach. It also tends to be slowly digested. So if you have a bigger meal of fat, your stomach will stay distended for a long time. The longer your stomach is distended, the more chance you have that of coming back up. So you might notice that fatty foods are giving you more reflux. Uh, and in an ideal world, you don't lie down for three or four hours after you eat. So you know we can use gravity to, uh, to help us do our work and uh, elevate the head of your bed four to eight inches. And uh, they actually make things that elevate your, the head of your bed. They look like industrial strength, uh, small caution cones or big chunky blocks of wood, or some people use cinder blocks. It tends to work better if you elevate the whole bed or have an adjustable bed versus just putting in more pillows underneath you, because oftentimes that puts more pressure and makes you bend right in the stomach, and then your head's bent too, and nothing's working to digest properly or maybe making more pressure rather than uh, letting gravity have things slide downhill. And we'll see that even in infants and, and neonatals, where they'll have lots of reflux, and you just got to tilt their bed upwards and let gravity help them do their work until they get a little bigger. Obviously, avoid uh, the meds that may worsen your GERD. Uh, so if you could be on one thing versus the other for your high blood pressure, and one of them may give you terrible GERD, and the other may give you no symptoms, well, then that's an easy change. Uh, and 
some of these aren't used too often. Theophylline used to be used a lot for asthma, and now it's almost uh, of historical uh, anecdote only. But uh, as we go through these, uh, CCB, calcium channel blocker, that's a very common uh, blood pressure medication. Uh, and alpha agonist is another uh, vasoactive medication. Nitrates are things like nitroglycerin, long-acting nitros, sedatives that you may take to go to bed, ironically, can cause more GERD, and NSAIDs, which are over-the-counter uh, pain relievers, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. This one at least has some evidence to it, but I don't know how much I believe it. I think you'd have to be a pretty tight-fitting clothing for that to cause enough pressure to make you have bad GERD. Uh, obviously, you can lose weight, uh, and you can stop smoking. A lot of times when I'm trying to figure out what made people suddenly have such bad symptoms with their GERD, often it is weight gain. Sometimes it's stress or something that brought it on and then it never gets better after that. And sometimes I can't figure out what finally made them have symptoms at all. So we'll quickly go through medications. I don't want to bore you guys to death. Uh, but the two categories that, that we have, like I talked about before, are uh, H2 blockers or histamine blockers and proton pump inhibitors. Uh, and the first one is uh, looking at people, how many percentage of people are gone of symptoms after being treated for 12 weeks or, uh, you know, a good long trial of, of, of these medications. <coughs> and you can see that much more people respond to proton pump inhibitors <laughs> than H2 blockers, but about 50% get over all their symptoms taking, you know, medications for, uh, you know, three months. <coughs> if you look at the healing rate, and this is looking at the healing of esophagitis or where that you're getting raw erosions to your esophagus. And again, about 50% heal on H2 blocker and 84% uh, heal with a, with a PPI. And if you break it down and, and for some reason we're able to look in their, their esophagus every week, 6% uh, per week had responded to that H2 blocker and 12% uh, per week had responded. So people respond at different rates, and if you follow it out long enough, most people will eventually get healing or remission of symptoms if you give them enough medication. It's just a matter of time and patience and somebody buying into the idea that it takes a long time for this to work. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm just a, a monkey with a scalpel up here. I'm a general surgeon, so where do I come in in terms of that part of my practice and, and procedures that prevent reflux from happening? And people that have failed medical management, you've sort of put them on double strength PPI, they're still having symptoms, or, you know, they're, they're miserable on the medications, or for some reason they, they can't take one of the medications that works really well and they're still having symptoms. Or if you guys tell me, you know, Doc, I, I don't like taking meds. I'm not on it, anything else, or I'm not on much more. Or every time I take this medication, it gives me a headache. I just don't like it. Is there anything else we can do? Sure, there's, there's surgery that can prevent reflux from happening. And then certain people that have, you know, a large hiatal hernia will, will have symptoms from that. You can imagine if your whole stomach, if your hiatal hernia has, has extended to the point where a substantial portion of your stomach is living up in your chest, that takes up valuable space for other things. And so some people can have so much of their stomach in their chest that they have a difficult time breathing. Uh, your stomach can uh, be stuck up in a hiatal hernia to the point where it loses its blood supply. That's pretty uncommon. Um, but a lot of people, if they have a large hiatal hernia, will have more sort of symptoms that you can't control no matter what you do. And then another, you know, good indication that somebody uh, would be uh, a good candidate for surgery uh, would be atypical symptoms. And then, so you're sim you have symptoms that don't make sense. You have asthma or, or erosions in the back of your throat. They don't feel like they have GERD, but their asthma, you just can't get it under control, or they have their, their teeth are getting just wore away to nothing from the acid, and you go ahead and do a pH probe study on them, and they have acid coming up every 10 minutes throughout the day. and All night long, there's acid exposure for two or three hours at a time. Well, those people are probably going to do a lot better you know, at managing those, those atypical symptoms if you do something to correct the reflux. So uh, in conclusion, you know, gastroesophageal reflux is a very common problem. Uh, there's problems that come as a consequence to it. Lifestyle modifications should always be the first step. Uh, medications are highly effective and safe with an asterisk. 
because uh, we touched on that a little bit already, and, and surgery is available to treat uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for coming.